Thank you, Representative Ellison, for joining us today. Good to be here, Chris. Thanks. I guess we're going to talk a little bit about the political process in the United States. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about why you decided to run for office in the first place. You know, service. I think it's important for everybody to contribute to society. And, uh, you know, people in our, in our nation's armed forces serve. People in our, you know, fire department, police department serve. Our teachers serve. And uh, all of us should find a way to contribute to society. So when I ran... Uh, I was uh, before I was doing that. I was practicing law, and I came to the conclusion that there were some things about the law that needed to be different. Uh, so I read, and uh, the rest is history. What were some of those issues that you saw with the law that you thought could be improved? Or? Well, I thought that the the administration of justice should be fair. It shouldn't single certain communities out as opposed to others. Uh, there was a significant overrepresentation of uh, African Americans in the criminal justice system, and I thought, you know, we need to have uh, more adequate funding for good public defenders. We need to make sure that uh, we have programs that uh, uh, give people a, a chance if they find themselves in staring the criminal justice system. We have to stop profiling, uh, and uh, so these are some things that, that motivated me to, to dive into it. But not only that, you know, I found that there are a significant number of my clients when I was practicing law who were not housed adequately, paying 70, 80 percent of their income just to live somewhere because their income was so low but the rent was so high. And, you know, those, those sort of a, a whole constellation of things. And then, of course, one of the things that made me run was, was environmental justice. You know, there were a lot of my clients and their children who had elevated levels of lead, uh, who had asthma, um, and uh, there were some old, dirty coal, uh, coal plants located near near uh, my district that I need. I wanted to get them converted to to natural gas, so they wouldn't be as uh, dirty. So I organized community to to change that, and all of that led me to run for office. So it was it was a, it was a, it was fairness in the criminal justice system. It was access to justice. It was environmental justice stuff and, and, and of course it was housing was a big focus of my work. And then of course um, you know I just I just felt like it's more important to do something about a problem than to observe and complain about it. So a lot of times uh, a lot of the work that I was doing was raising issues with the way other people were doing doing things. And uh, one day a close relative of mine said well you know I think these people have a tough job, and if you think you could do it better, maybe you should dive into it. So, so I did, and that was about nine years ago. I guess speaking of the human rights and equality issues, uh, you're very well known <coughs> for being the first Muslim member elected to the House of Representatives. What has that meant to you, kind of personally and professionally? You know, it uh, hasn't meant that much to me personally. I mean, I never ran to be the first of anything. I don't really think that much about it. Uh, I think it is important, though. I mean, when I first ran, and, and I, I didn't understand why everybody was excited about this. Um, but then, you know, I, I did sort of take it into a larger context and recognize that it, that it said something really good about my district that, you know, only a few years after 9-11 that they would elect somebody who was Muslim. Um, I never really fully appreciated it, but somebody pointed out to me and said, look, Keith, think about somebody of Japanese ancestry running a few years after Pearl Harbor. You know, that, that might, I mean, that might be significant, that the population would, would not let that be a barrier to service. So I don't think about it much. Uh, I just do my job. You know, but I, but I do think in the larger context that it says something really good about the people of my, of my district and my country. And how do you think people in your district and, I guess, in the United States broadly view Muslims now 10 years after the incidents of 9-11? You know, it, 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 that's funny, Chris, because right after 9-11, uh, the public opinion polls about Muslims in general uh, were not as bad as they are today. Uh, there has, there's an important uh, report issued by a group called the Center for American Progress. And uh, the name of the report is Fear, Inc., Fear Incorporated. And uh, this report details how uh, a group of 
foundations funneled about $43 million over 10 years uh, into simply anti-Muslim hate. And they funded think tanks that produced this kind of material and uh, funded uh, you know, different propagandists to promote this kind of idea. And uh, the culmination of their work was uh, this whole big fight uh, about the uh, Islamic Center down in uh, lower Manhattan. This was not a spontaneous uh, sort of uh, uh, upsurge of, of people who didn't want that Islamic Center built there. There's a church there. There's a couple of, uh, you know, head shops there. I mean, it's not exactly the most pristine environment anyway. But the people wanted to object to this Islamic Center that was not on Ground Zero, but within a few blocks, uh, was, was not in the group that assembled by accident. This was a, this was a part of this anti-Muslim uh, industry that, that uh, organized themselves and uh, decided to turn this into an issue. So you got, uh, so there's groups in, our, in, in, uh, in the United States, one of them is the Southern Poverty Law Center, who has identified these leading groups as the moral equivalent of the Ku Klux Klan. So, for example, the, Islam, the Stop the Islamization of America is, uh, is such a group as this, and uh, they've been designated as a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center that tracks this kind of thing. And, um, you know, the bottom line is, it's, when you talk about the, the changing way that Americans view Islam and Muslims, uh, it, it, it has been as a result of concerted effort by some people to tarnish the image of Muslims. Now I will say, you know, the Muslim community has an important responsibility, and that is to engage and get involved and demonstrate um, uh, a degree of connectedness to the community. Right. So I've been working on that quite a bit too. I guess, and so my, my question would be, you know, as part of, you know, you being uh, the first elected Muslim representative of Congress, you know, that I think that says a lot about the diversity of America. It does. I mean, you know, America is a country where, you know, we do have, we take this issue of freedom and liberty seriously. Uh, and, and of course, we've, we've fought long and hard to arrive at where we are. I mean, this is a country started as a slaveholding nation, fought a, a momentous civil war to rid itself of that evil then went through segregation for another 100 years and then had a civil rights movement to get rid of that that took another 100 years. So, so the thing is, is that America has arrived at a place where we really have fought hard for the way we value diversity and inclusion. And it's not just ma by magic or by any inherent virtue. It's, it's that we've gone through the experience of exclusion and suppression of certain populations. We've gone through Japanese internment. We've gone through uh, the the women's rights movement, uh, and, and these and these things have brought us to a place today where we truly value uh, uh, the diversity of our nation. And uh, I think that you know this. I mean, the culminating event uh, was probably the election of Barack Obama. But 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 the thing is, is that yes, in America, uh, you can be Shia, you can be Sunni, you can be. Uh, Sufi, you can be Ibadi, you can practice Islam any kind of way you want to, you can practice Christianity any way you want to. Methodists, Lutherans, Baptists, Catholics, all down the line. You could be a, you could be an Orthodox Jew, or you could be a Reformed Jew, or you can be, I mean, you got, so in America, you know, the, the people are free to choose, to, to choose their faith. You know, and our Constitution says that the Congress shall make no law uh, uh, interfering with the free exercise of religion. So this is an important um, uh, principle in our nation, and, uh, but it has to be reinforced and fought for. I guess speaking <coughs> of uh, human rights and equality issues, you said you celebrated a, month, a uh, number of civil rights anniversaries this year. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you Oh yeah, about? no question. Uh, well, you know, uh, I was in uh, Alabama last, le a few weeks ago with my kids. Uh, the, John Lewis, who was, a, who was an iconic figure in the American Civil Rights Movement, spoke at the March on Washington in 63, had his head bashed in in 1965 when he was leading a voting rights march. Um, he uh, called a number of people to Washington just a few days ago and <clears throat> reminded us that we were, we were creeping up on the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. Uh, 
the anniversary of uh, the 48th anniversary of the of Bloody Sunday, uh, and 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 he will talk, you know, really glowingly about great statements about civil rights and inclusion that John F. Kennedy made and the work that Robert Kennedy did as he fought uh, day and night and stayed um, on the phone and, and directly engaged with efforts to integrate schools in the American South. So these are some of the big dates coming up. And you know, everybody should pause and think about the uh, awesome progress our nation has made uh, along these lines. And it was through great leadership Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, and, and many others who, who chose to change our society in a definitive, meaningful, irreversible ways, but also through nonviolent means. So yeah, those are some important dates coming up. You mentioned uh, John Lewis there, obviously. Is there any other political kind of role models or mentors that you've had for the last you know, 15, 20 years? Oh yeah, well Paul Wellstone. Uh, Senator Paul Wellstone died in a plane crash in 2002, but he is the one who, who really taught me that you can be in regular electoral politics and preserve your system of values uh, at the same time. And uh, among some people, particularly among the, the people who were on the political left, you know, there, there was this cynicism that, you know, you either had to have your values or you could be in politics, but you could not be in both. And, you know, he demonstrated that that was not true. And that when, we, and that when running for office was not about making a statement, but about making a real change. And so, uh, yeah, he certainly is a great political hero of mine. And, uh, and of course, there are many others, you know. I mean, uh, I, there's, there's no doubt I'm a huge admirer of Nancy Pelosi. I'm a a huge admirer of of, uh, of 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 a number of folks who are in politics today, but who but who blazed trails years ago. Representative Ellison, thank you, Chris. Today. All the best. Pleased to be here.